look at Genesis chapter 41, I believe in part we will see that uh, verse 12 that uh, Michael just read for us, 1 Corinthians 2.12, kind of lived out in Joseph's life. It says, now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. In uh, Genesis chapter 41, we're going to see Joseph, who has been given wisdom from God. And uh, wisdom in order even to know the future. And what God has spoken to him and to the nation, uh, to the king of Egypt during that time. You know, in our journey through this last section of the book of Genesis... It tells the story, of course, of Joseph. We have observed in this story um, two predominant themes. The first of those is God's providence. The providence of God. That, in other words, that God works in all circumstances of this world and in our lives to accomplish his will for His purposes and His glory. God's providence is never absent, nor is He ever passive. God is always at work through His providence, bringing about His purposes according to His will for His glory. Secondly, we have seen that God is fulfilling the promises that he made to Abraham in his covenant with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. God is fulfilling his purposes to make of Jacob's family a great nation through whom he will bless the whole world just as he promised to Abraham. And like all of Scripture, this story in the book of Genesis, the story of Joseph, and even this section that we're reading here in Genesis chapter 41, finds its ultimate fulfillment in the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ our Lord. And so, Genesis 41 is a long chapter. There are 57 verses in this chapter, so we're not going to read the whole chapter as we begin, begin today. We'll be reading sections of it as we go through the message today. But we can outline uh, this uh, chapter in four words. Dreams, interpretation, plan, and promotion. Pharaoh had two disturbing dreams which none of his advisors could, could interpret for him. And then Joseph was brought before Pharaoh, and God enabled him to take action for the future of Egypt. And then we finally see that Pharaoh promotes Joseph to the second highest ruler there in Egypt, and Joseph implements the plan that he had proposed to Pharaoh to save Egypt from the coming famine. In all of this, we will see the hand of God's <clears throat> sovereign providence directing these events for His purposes, for His glory. So first of all, let's look at Pharaoh's dreams in verses 1 through 13. Listen along. Then it came to pass... At the end of two full years, that Pharaoh had a dream, and behold, he stood by the river. Suddenly there came up out of the river seven cows, fine looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river, and the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking and fat cows, so Pharaoh awoke. He slept and dreamed a second dream, and suddenly seven heads of grain came up on one stalk. 
plump and good, then behold, seven thin heads, blighted by the east wind, sprang up after them, and the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump and full heads. So Pharaoh awoke, and indeed, it was a dream. Now it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. Then indeed, then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I remember my faults this day. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker, we each had a dream in one night, he and I. Each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now there was a young Hebrew man with us there, a servant of the captain of the guard, and we told him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each man he interpreted according to his own dream. And it came to pass, just as he interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored me to my office, and he hanged him. And so Moses informs us here that uh, it's been two <laughs> full years that have passed since Joseph had given the chief butler a favorable interpretation of his dream while he was in prison, and, had, and Joseph had implored the, the butler to remember him and to rescue him from prison because Joseph had been wrongly in prison. He had done nothing wrong, and he was there... Uh, being wrongfully in prison. But we know from the last verse of Genesis chapter 40, that is Genesis 40, 23, it says the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. But that forgetting, even the forgetting, was God's providence. Because God had a perfect time for Joseph's release and Joseph's elevation in the court of Pharaoh. And so the occasion for all of this was the dreams of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Later in the chapter, we're going to learn that God himself gave Pharaoh these dreams. They weren't random dreams. They didn't, weren't just because of something he ate that night. It was God gave these dreams to Pharaoh for a specific purpose. You'll see that in verse 25 and verse 28 and again in verse 32. We'll look at that in a little bit. But the dreams were dramatic and they were disturbing. After each dream, Pharaoh was awakened and the dreams were uh, distressing to Pharaoh for a couple different reasons. One, they followed one after the other. They were both similar and they, was, they were both interrupted by him being awakened by them. Their meaning to him was puzzling. He couldn't figure it out. Seven lean cows remaining lean and gaunt even after consuming uh, the fat cows. And the same was true with the grain. It was not normal, of course, for cows to eat cows or grain to uh, consume other grain. This was strange enough, but... But those things should have been fattened after eating the others. And they weren't. Something had to be wrong in these dreams. But what was it? The king's usual, usual source of information, as you read in verse 8, all the magicians in, of Egypt and all its wise men were totally baffled, just like Pharaoh. These were the wisest, most educated men in Pharaoh's kingdom. They were schooled in the art of interpreting dreams, but they could not fathom the meaning of the dream. Lincoln Duncan comments this about that. He says, Moses is putting before you a picture of the God of Egypt, Pharaoh. Stumped. He hasn't a clue what is going to happen in his own land, the land over which he reigns. And so he's showing us a picture of the weakness of the gods of this age and of this world. And he's preparing 
us to contrast Pharaoh with himself, the God of Joseph, who knows and reveals the future. You see, although Pharaoh was the mightiest man in Egypt, and though he was thought to be a god by his own subjects, he was helpless to understand his own dream. Listen, money and power and worldly success may gain us many things, but it is all worthless in discerning the things of God. The magicians in uh, Pharaoh's court, they were stumped as well. As we read in the New Testament, uh, the writings of Paul in 1 Corinthians, the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. And the, the things of the Spirit cannot be discerned by the natural man. They are spiritually discerned. And so these magicians were stumped as well. A thousand years of pagan religion could not reveal the truth that God was giving to Pharaoh. And it reveals the true condition of the human mind and the human heart apart from God. Without divine revelation, without God revealing himself and his truth and his will to people... Human wisdom and human power can never discover the truth of God. That's why we need the Word of God. That's why God has spoken so clearly to us in the pages of Scripture because this is the Word of God by which He has revealed Himself and apart from Him revealing Himself, we would not know God. Without divine revelation. We would not know the truth of God, nor would we have even a clue about the way of salvation. That has to come down from God above. Paul asks in 1 Corinthians 1.20, he says, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And Paul answers in chapter 2 saying, But the natural man does not re receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2.14 And so the king is frustrated. And the king's frustration at having such impressive dreams, and yet being unable to know their meaning, it reminds me of, of the, what had happened to the chief butler and the chief baker that we read about in chapter 40. You remember there that they had both had dreams and they both couldn't understand them. And Joseph said, do not dreams belong to God. Tell them to me. And so if we look at chapter 41 verses 9 through 13, we find that the chief butler finally remembers Joseph, probably at the prompting of the Lord himself. It says in verse 9, Then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I remember my faults this day. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in custody of the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker, we each had a dream in one night, he and I, each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. And there was a young Hebrew man with us there, a servant of the captain of the guard, who told him, and he interpreted our dreams for us to each man, he interpreted according to his own dream, and it came to pass just as he interpreted for us, so it happened, he restored me to my office and he hanged me out. So now we begin to see God's providence in sending the butler and the baker into the prison where Joseph was kept, where Joseph served them, and where Joseph interpreted their dreams. We might have wondered why the chief butler forgot Joseph and why God let him languish in prison for two more years. But now we see that God had prepared Joseph 
for this appointed time, for this appointed purpose. And so Joseph, in the next tells us, was hurriedly brought up out of the prison and he was made to stand before the king. So we look at verses 14 to 32, Joseph's interpretation. First, let's look at verses 14 through 16. It says, Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon, and he shaved and changed his clothing and came to Pharaoh. This is interesting because this is this shows a, a great knowledge by Moses, of course, who spent 40 years in growing up in Egypt. It shows us that you know, Moses knows a lot about Egyptian culture and the difference between Egypt and Hebrew culture. Because the Hebrews, uh, it was their culture to grow their beards long and not to shave. Uh, very few of the Hebrews would shave. They would think it was the glory of a man to grow a great big long beard. Uh, but the, the Egyptians, uh, they considered long beards to be uh, just awful. And they would, uh, they would shave and they would uh, have, oftentimes even they would shave their head. And so even, uh, you know, in the movie The Ten Commandments, a Joel Brenner is uh, portraying the Pharaoh and he bald. Well, that was probably pretty close to the truth. And uh, so this is, it was, shows us, you know, again, um, the truth of Scripture and the historicity of Scripture here. But as we go on reading verse 15, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream and there is no one who can interpret it, but I have heard it said of you that you can understand the dream and to interpret it. So Joseph answered to Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Don't you just love Joseph's answer to Pharaoh and his ability to, about his ability to interpret the dreams? He says, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer. It's the ability to interpret dreams, which the butler had credited to Joseph and Pharaoh credits to Joseph, was not Joseph's at all. Joseph says, only God can interpret dreams. God is the revealer of the future. Joseph is going to reveal the future, not because he has some innate power in himself to know the interpretation of dreams, but because God, whom he knows, Joseph knows God. And because he knows God, he knows the God who controls the future. And God reveals the future whenever he wills to do that. Joseph is clear on that. Without God, I'm nothing, Joseph would say. He is the source of any correct interpretation. And so Joseph just doesn't just think to himself that, that God was the source of, the, of his ability to interpret dreams. He tells that to Pharaoh. He's bold in his testimony, in his witness to who God is. I like what Leopold writes in his commentary. He says, after 12 years and more of injustice, Joseph's first consideration when he's brought before Pharaoh, is not deliverance for himself, but to take care that his relation to his God be upright and that he testify of it. Is that your first thought? When someone asks you about your talents, or your success, or how you can have such joy in your life, even when you have gone through tribulation, affliction, and sickness, and disease, and trouble, and in your marriage, or in your home life, and, and how, how, you, how you can get through these things, what's your answer? Well, I just have been a good person. 
<laughs> oh, surely not. That's not. That wasn't Joseph's answer, was it? He said, it's not in me. It's not in me. What a great <coughs> answer. It's not in me. It's the Lord God. There's a false teacher that I've heard on the uh, on video several times and has a great big church in North Carolina. And one of his famous sermons is, it's in you. <laughs> it's always been in you. What a false teaching. It's never been in me. It's never been about me. It's always been what God has done, what God can do. It's never been about me. It's always been about him. And that's what Joseph says. It's not in me. It's about God. It's about what He can do. Is your daily aim to do all things in your life, every word that you speak, everything that you do, to do it all to the glory of God? If that's your aim, if that's your goal, then when opportunities like this come up, <laughs> And they will. Opportunities like Joseph had to speak a word about his God. Then you will have take that opportunity to, to bear witness of what Christ has done in your life. And who God is. Pharaoh then uh, eagerly repeated his dreams to Joseph. Closing by confessing. Uh, his own inability to understand the dreams. It says in verse 17, uh, Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream I stood on the bank of the river. Suddenly seven cows came up out of the river. Again, that's a very Egyptian thing. The cows would often graze in the Nile River. The Nile is the source of all life in Egypt. Uh, this great river, the uh, longest river in the world, uh, two branches that go out from it, the Blue Nile, the White Nile, and they both come together and water the whole area of, of Upper and Lower Egypt at that time. And, and Egypt uh, was dependent greatly upon this river. And so you have uh, these, these cows coming up out of the river, and the cows would often graze in the river, one, to keep the flies off, and two, because they would graze on the marsh reeds and grass in the river. And so uh, it's a very, again, a very Egyptian thing. So suddenly seven cows came up out of the river looking, looking fine looking and fat and they fed in the meadow and behold seven other cows came up after them poor and very ugly and gaunt. And the word that it uses there for ugly and gaunt is, is the word bad, evil. Uh, this is, uh, these were evil looking cows and and such, he says, such ugliness as I've never seen in all the land of Egypt. It was a frightful thing that he saw. Verse 20. And the gaunt and ugly cows ate up the first seven <coughs> fat cows. A strange thing that had happened. Verse 21. Then when they had eaten them up, no one would have known it. For they had, you know, when they had eaten them, for they were just as ugly as at the beginning. So I awoke. And verse 22. Also I saw... In my dream, and suddenly seven heads came up in one stalk, full and good. Now normally uh, a stalk of grain or, or corn or whatever would have one or at the most two heads of grain on them. This one had seven, uh, uh, showing the fullness of that. Not only were there seven uh, full heads, but they were plump and, and, and ripe and, and, uh, and just overflowing with abundance there. He says... Full and good. Verse 23, and the behold, seven heads withered and thin and blighted by the east wind. The east wind there in, in Egypt comes off of the Sahara Desert. Right? This is that terrible wind, the dry wind that comes out uh, from, from the west and blows to the east and just, just destroys everything. And so he says, they, uh, this wind came up and blighted them and... Verse 24, and the thin heads uh, devoured the seven good heads. So I told this to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. And so Joseph immediately has the interpretation from God. Verse 25, 
Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Notice he's going to say three times in here that it is God who is at work. It is God who is revealing to Pharaoh what he is going to do. It says it in verse 25, verse 28, verse 32. Now look at it again. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads are seven years. The dreams are one. And the seven thin and ugly cows which came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty heads blighted by the east wind are seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Indeed, seven years of great plenty will come throughout all the land of Egypt, but after them seven years of famine will arise, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine will deplete the land. So the plenty will not be known in the land because of the famine following, for it will be very severe. And the, the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because the thing is established by God. And God will shortly bring it to pass. So Joseph interprets and he explains these dreams to Pharaoh. But as he does so, he makes it clear that it is God who is not only the revealer of dreams, he is the one who in fact ordains the future. God not only knows what's going to happen, but he knows what's going to happen because he has ordained what is going to happen. God is in control over what is going to happen. Twice, Joseph says, God has shown Pharaoh what he is going to do. And again in verse 32, he says, the thing is established. It's ordained by God. God will bring it to pass. The future of Egypt does not depend on what Pharaoh does or doesn't do at all. Even though his subjects think of him as the son, the, the son of the sun god, Ra, they think he is, he is God incarnate on earth. They think of Pharaoh as, as one of their gods, and yet he is powerless. He can do nothing. It is the God of the Hebrews, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God whom Joseph knows intimately and personally. It is this God who is in control of all things. It is that God who is sovereign over the events of Egypt. He directs all these things according to his purposes for his own glory. Job came to this realization when he said to the Lord in Job 42, verse 2, he said, I know that you can do everything, and no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. God is in charge of all things. Nebuchadnezzar, that powerful king of Babylon, spoke uh, after uh, being humbled by the Lord during the days of Daniel, and he said, in Daniel chapter 4, and at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored Him who lives forever. For His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom is from generation to generation, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to His will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can restrain His hand or say to Him, What have you done? This is God. God is able to reveal the future because God ordains the future. That's how prophecy works. Why, why is, is the Old Testament able to prophesy so clearly and so uh, in such detail about the coming and the ministry and the death and resurrection and exaltation and return of our Lord Jesus Christ because God not only knew it, he foreordained it, and he works everything in according to his will to bring it to pass. God is sovereign over these things. All things. Well, how easy.
easy it would have been to, for Joseph just to stop there and tell Pharaoh his dream, but Joseph doesn't stop there. There was good news and bad news for Pharaoh, abundance followed by famine, but Joseph gives Pharaoh more. It gives him a plan for the future. So we see in verses 33 through 37, Joseph's plan. Verse 33, now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man. Let him set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land and collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years and let them gather all the food of those years that are coming and store, them, store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. Then that food shall be as a reserve for the land of the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land may not perish during the famine. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And so Joseph tells Pharaoh not only what he's about to, what God is about to do, but what God can do for them through a wise man. You know, just because God is sovereign over all things, and God ordains what will happen, it does not mean that we are not responsible for our actions. And God expects us to act responsibly in response <laughs> to His sovereignty. See, there is a connection between God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. This is what God's going to do, Joseph says. This is what you need to do in response. God's revelation everywhere in Scripture always requires a response. If God reveals that He is going to bring judgment, the response that is required is always what? Repent. God is going to bring judgment. <clears throat> turn back to Him. Turn away from your sin. If God is going, it brings a revelation that that he, uh, of warning, like this one, what is our response to be? Responsible activity in accordance with what he has revealed. And that's what Joseph proposes. Joseph's plan was in five steps. Put the right man in charge, verse 33. Appoint overseers in the land, verse 34. Collect a heavy tax of grain over those seven good years. That's a double tithe. It's, it's not one-tenth, it's, it's one-fifth that they're going to collect. But it's so plentiful during those years that people don't even mind, I'm sure. You know, if, if you're making double or triple what you normally make, giving up a, a fifth of that's not a big deal. And so they do that. Number four, strategically store and guard the grain. He stores it in the cities, that is, in the places, near the places where it was grown. If it's grown in this area, they store it in this city. If it's grown in this area, they store it in this city. And, everybody, and they put people in charge of that over each one of those sections. He puts officials over that, probably from those provinces. And so the people are invested in this. They're storing this, the, the grain in their own cities, and, and there it is. It will be ready for them. Number five, finally distribute the reserved grain in the seven years of famine. And everyone saw the wisdom in Joseph's plan. And so this was the impetus for uh, point number four, Joseph's promotion and his program. Verse 38 it says, And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find such a one as this man in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all of this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house and over my, all my people, and, shall be uh, and my people uh, shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. 
Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand, put it on Joseph's hand, clothed him in garments of linen, and put a fine, and put a gold chain around his neck, and he had him ride in the second chariot, which he had, and cried out before him, Bow the knee. So he set him over all the land of Egypt, and Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphonaneah, and he gave him the wife Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, the priest of On. So Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. See, although he was a pagan ruler, Pharaoh recognized the work of the Spirit of God when he saw it. He made Joseph his second in command, which really made him the second most powerful person in the world, as Egypt was the world power back in those days. He sealed the deal in regal fashion. He gave Joseph a signet ring. It's like having the king's credit card. Right? He gave him a linen clothing, a sign of high honor. He gave him a gold chain, a sign of royal authority. He gave him a chariot so he could go anywhere he wished in royal fashion. He had the soldiers call out, bow down as, Ju as uh, Joseph passed by so everyone would get the message, who's in charge. And he gave him a name. That to the Egyptians would mean savior of the world. And to which to the Hebrews would mean revealer of secrets. Finally, Pharaoh gave Joseph a wife from a priestly family. Making him nobility in Egypt. How much of this did Joseph see in advance, you think? Not a bit. Even though he had dreamed that his brothers and his father and everyone in his family would bow down to him, I don't imagine Joseph ever dreamed that all of Egypt and the nations of the world would come and bow before him. How much of it happened by chance? Not a bit of it. It was all by the design plan of God. The final section gives us several purposes. I think it serves several purposes. First, it reveals the accuracy of Joseph's in interpretation. We're going to see that. Second, it evidences the administrative astuteness of Joseph in handling all the affairs that were put under his charge. And finally, it reveals to us Joseph's continued spiritual commitment to the God of his fathers. Look at it, verse 46. Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. Now in the seven plentiful years, the ground brought forth abundantly. So he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt. He laid up this food in the cities, and laid up in every city the food of the fields which surrounded them. Joseph gathered very much grain as the sand of the sea until he stopped counting, for it was so immeasurable. And Joseph was, to Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of On, bore to him. Joseph called the name of his firstborn Manasseh, for God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. So Joseph displays his faith in the naming of his sons here, Manasseh and Ephraim. They're Hebrew names. Notice he doesn't give them uh, Egyptian names, like the Pharaoh had given to Joseph, but he gives them names in the Hebrew, like his fathers had done. And even though he was living in Egypt, and even though he married an Egyptian woman who was the daughter of a pagan priest, Joseph gave his two sons names that, that, by which he would remember forever their true heritage as sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
tells us that though he appeared to be Egyptian on the outside, on the inside, he still worshipped the God of his fathers. He named his firstborn Manasseh, which sounds like the Hebrew word for forget. He even spilled out the meaning so no one would mistake it. God has made me forget all my hardship in my father's house. He didn't mean that he had forgotten his family. He, we'll see later in the story, his family is much on his mind, especially his father. But it means that God had enabled him to forget the pain and the rejection and the betrayal that he experienced from his brothers. The second child he named Ephraim, which means fruitful. The Hebrew is a form that means uh, something like super fruitful or double fruitful. The land of my affliction, as he says there, refers to all that he had suffered in Egypt there and being uh, brought as a slave and put in, in Potiphar's house and then in the prison and, and all of the things that had happened to him there. He had suffered so much. But now... He was receiving double blessing. J. Vernon McGee calls Joseph's two sons amnesia, never forgotten, and ambrosia. I thought that was good. I just had to throw that in. The order of these names is important. Manasseh comes before Ephraim. First, we are set free from bitterness able to forget those things and to leave behind the things that have hurt us. We do that through Jesus Christ who has forgiven our sins so that we can forgive those who have sinned against us. And Manasseh comes first and then Ephraim. We are set free from bitterness and then we experience the blessing. That, too, was because of God's sovereignty. When a man believes in the sovereign God, he can let go and move on and be blessed by God. Let me conclude with just three quick observations. One, this story demonstrates that the Lord is the most high God, is sovereign over all creation, and the affairs of men. He not only knows the future, he ordains it for his own good purposes. We have seen that. Second, this story highlights how God begins to fulfill the promises made to Abraham. God had promised Abraham that he would bless him, that he would make his name great, that he would make of him a great nation, and that through him all the nations, all the families of the earth would be blessed. And in Joseph, these promises are beginning to be fulfilled. They are initially and partially fulfilled. Because in Joseph, we will see that through Joseph, he not only blesses the, the nation of Egypt, but he blesses the nations that surround them as they all come to, to be blessed by the blessings that have come through Joseph to Egypt. And even his brothers will come and receive that blessing as well. And we'll see that these things which are partially fulfilled in Joseph will be ultimately fulfilled in the seed of Abraham, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died for our sins and was raised for our justification, that through him all the nations of the earth will be blessed as we bring the gospel to them and sit that if they will believe on Jesus, they will be saved from their sins and from death and from hell and will receive the, the blessings of life forever with God in heaven. Number three, the story of Joseph demonstrates the proper response to the knowledge of God's sovereign will is responsible and wise 
was for Joseph. It's what he did. It's for us. You see, for instance, God has revealed his sovereign will to save a people for himself from every tribe and nation and language through his son, Jesus Christ. Hasn't he? That's, and he, but how is God going to do that? By his sovereign will, he knows those whom he will save. He has elected those whom he will save. But listen, God's sovereignty and salvation does not at all relieve us of our responsibility. Not one bit. <coughs> God has given us the responsibility of preaching the gospel to all the world so that men might hear the word of truth that Jesus died for their sins, that he was raised from the dead, that he is coming again, and that all who believe in him will have eternal life. And if we don't preach the gospel, we are shirking our responsibility. God is sovereign. We are responsible not only to believe, but also to share the truth that God has given us. Let's stand together as we pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the message of your sovereignty our responsibility. Thank you for the message that you work all things according to your providence for your glory. And yet, God, you are also fulfilling your promises through us who have believed on Jesus Christ. Lord, use us to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.